Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to, to welcome you to lesson 10 and I would like to thank all the students who have subscribed to this page and uh, thank you so much for uh, desiring to learn. And I also want to thank all students all over the country who are endeavoring to study despite the hard challenges of lockdown. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to look at phylum quadata in this lesson and in this phylum we shall look at uh, members includes the reptiles the mammals the birds the fish the amphibians so we'll be focusing so much on their general characteristics and also the members in this in those different classes that we shall look at well let's me let me start with uh, introducing to you some of the structures or characteristic features that are found in all members of phylum codata. There is a possession of the notochord. Now, this notochord is a body plan that is made up of a rigid and flexible dorsal cord, which consists of evacuated cells surrounded by a tough outer coat. Now, in the in primitive codets, as we shall see later on, the lower codets, the notochord still persists up to date. However, in higher codets, this notochord has been modified into the vertebral column, the vertebral bones. So where there was supposed to be notochord, uh, in the modern codets, the vertebrates, they have the vertebral column. And then the codets also have a hollow dorsal nerve cord, or in simple terms, you would call it the central nervous system. This is a common characteristic in all the codets. Uh, in the present day, higher organisms, including in man, this feature is now the, 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 the spinal cord, yeah, the spinal cord and the nerves associated with it. So this is the common in all uh, codets. And then they also have the pharyngeal gill slits. Sometimes in some books they call it the vis they call them the visceral clefts. The visceral clefts are there in many organisms. However, they have been modified uh, in different uh, organisms to serve different purposes, as we shall see later on. Uh, in vertebrates, a number of slits is greatly reduced and may be modified for different purposes. For example. In fish and in the larval stages of the amphibians, the tadpoles, these visceral clefts are modified to form the gills, which are used for gaseous exchange. However, in higher organisms like the reptiles, birds, and mammals, uh, the visceral clefts uh, or the pharyngeal uh, uh, slits are modified into the eustachian tube. And in mammals, particularly uh, in man, they have the station tube, but also the three bones of the ear, the incus, the steps, and the malleus. Those three, three small bones are part, the remnants of the visceral clefts. Uh, yeah. So, but in the primitive codets, uh, these uh, visceral clefts are still existent up to now. And like I told you, organisms underwent adaptive radiation, and uh, as a result of evolution. So most of these structures were modified to serve purposes where they are found. So uh, those ones are the key characteristics of the codets. Possession of the notochord, possession of the hollow dorsal nerve cord, and then the pharyngeal gill slits or visceral clefts. However, there are also other characteristics of codets which may be shared by other organisms they include the following for example they have the post anal tail most of the codets have the tails by the way including man we also have uh, a tail we have uh, though it is not visible on the exterior but we have the caudal vertebrae the caudal vertebrae are meant to, at the beginning of the tail but uh, due to evolution, our tail was cut off. But our relatives, the chimps, I mean the, the, the monkeys, have the tails. 
So, um, most of the organisms, the cows, the bulls, and so on, have tails. So that is a characteristic of vertebrates. And then they have segmented muscle blocks uh, that are called the myotomes, which are considered as secondary adaptive structures for swimming. And these ones are more prominent in aquatic organisms, aquatic chordates. Then they have closed circulatory system. This is a characteristic of all the chordates. Well, we can look at that uh, general body plan and we want to start with the, the first part one there. Uh, we can look at the notochord. And we say you see the location of the notochord and is a long flexible rod of mesoderm found in all chordates. And then in the vertebrates, it's replaced by the, the backbone, what we said earlier. So the notochord in the higher vertebrates, in the higher chordates, the vertebrates, the notochord is replaced by the backbone, yeah, the vertebrae. And then we have the dorsal hollow nerve cord, uh, which is the ectodermal tissue that forms the spinal cord. So that dorsal nerve cord is the present day uh, central nervous system where we have the, the spinal cord, the brain, and the nerves. They are, they are originating from the dorsal hollow nerve cord. And then uh, chordates are meant to be having post anal tail, as you can see from there. Uh, they have a tail which is continuous. However, in other organisms, the tail was lost as a result of evolution because it was no longer necessary. And then we have pharyngeal clefts. These pharyngeal clefts, uh, I told you earlier, they are modified in higher organisms to serve purposes, especially either for hearing or for gaseous exchange in different organisms. So that is the general body plan of the chordates. Uh, those are the key structures that all chordates must possess. If an organism satisfies those ones, then it will be classified in phylum codata. Okay. Now this phylum codata is divided in two, two major groups. We have acuraniata and curaniata. Uh -huh. Acuraniata and curaniata. So let's start with the acuraniata. These are codets without the skull and the notochord. I mean... They don't have the skull, but they have a notochord. They retain the original notochord. Yeah? But they don't have the skull, the cranium. And uh, we see that the notochord is not replaced by the vertebral column. Uh, yes, those are the, the acraniates. Yeah, that belong to group acraniata. And then this acraniata, those members that don't have the skull, are divided into other groups. We have a subgroup, Tunicata or Eurocodata. So these members include the sea squids and their relatives. And uh, their characteristic is that they, have, they still have the notochord, meaning these fellows are the primitive codets we are talking about. Yeah, however, the, the adult uh, members of this group are sessile. They don't even move. They are just filter feeders. Yeah, they feed on remnants, particles from the water. They are largely aquatic. And then we have another group of the acuraniates or acuraniata called the cephalocodata. So the members of this uh, group include the amphioxus and then the characteristics uh, that their larvae are free living. So their larvae uh, move, they swim about. And then the adults possess uh, the pharynx, which is modified for filter feeding. And then they also have the notochord. So when you look at the members of group Acraniata, these members still uh, retain the original structures, composition of the coded structure, like the, 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 the notochord. And then they are also aquatic, and then uh, some of them are sessile. So they are largely really primitive members of phylum codata and then the second group is craniata or vertebrata those are now the vertebrates we're talking about 
Yeah, this subfile I'm craniata or the vertebrates. So these are codes which uh, which have the skull or the cranium. They have the skull or the cranium enclosing them. The notochord is replaced by the vertebral column. You remember we talked about the notochord and the vertebral column. The notochord develops into the vertebral column, which is made up of either the bone or the cartilage, as you know, uh, even in man. Then they have two pairs of limbs there are th for those that have limbs and oh, there are those that you have fins, for example, the fish, two pairs of them at least. However, others may have more, as we may see later on. They have a well-developed central nervous system consisting of the, the, the brain, the spinal cord and the nerves that are well-developed and also including the sense organs, the eyes, the ears, and other sensory structures that we we have uh, then these vertebrates can be divided into some sub subphyla uh, for example we have subphylum agnatha these are craniates that don't have jaws they are vertebrates but they don't have jaws and they are majorly fishes so we call them jawless fish or jawless fishes and they include uh, the members of the class cisclostosoma or i mean cis cisclostomata they belong to the class cisclostomata these are members of the jawless fish and they include uh, the humphreys and the hagfish so let's look at their general characteristics they don't have paired fins like uh, you would see in other fish and then they are semi ectoparasites. Sometimes they are parasites, sometimes they are free living. So they are semi ectoparasites. But when they are parasites, they attach on the bodies of other bigger fish and then they suck blood from them or even dropping, dropping food from them. Um, they have gills, of course, being aquatic uh, champions there, they must have gills for gaseous exchange. And then uh, they have round sartorial mouth parts and a rasping tongue. So they have a tongue which is used for rasping, just like the ones for the snails. And then they also have uh, a mouth parts which are adapted for sucking. It's what we call the sartorial mouth parts. So they can suck the, when they are especially, when they live as parasites. They have well-developed notochord in adults. Yeah, so that is a group uh subphylum agnatha subphylum agnatha so you can see some of them there the hagfish then we have the humphrey they, they almost look quite close what is common with them is that they don't have jaws they are jawless uh, fish and then we have another phylum i mean another subphylum gnathos tomata we have Phyla, subphylum gnatostomata, the gnatostoms. These are craniates or vertebrates with jaws. So these vertebrates have jaws. So they are jawed fish. And they include the following classes, chondrichites. So examples include, uh, this one sometimes are called the cartilaginous fish, the chondrichites or the cartilaginous fish, the sharks, the rays, the skates, and so on. Those ones are chondrichites. And then for them, uh, they have placid scales, the, the tooth-like kind of scales, but they are small and uh, not so easy to identify in some species. Uh, they are really close, they attach the skin. Uh, the skin contains dermal dentricles. Uh, these are tooth-like structures. Uh, with a central pulp cavity surrounding an outer covering of the enamel. So those ones are used for defense and for covering the skin. Then we have, they have pin, uh, fins, the pectoral and the pelvic fins are present and they are two, two, they are paired. Pectoral fins are paired and then also pelvic fins are paired. Then uh, for them, the visceral clefts are present uh, as separate gill openings. So they have a number of gill openings 
a representative of the visceral clefts we talked about. Uh, the anus is ventrally positioned, and so is the mouth. So when you look at the shark feeding, their mouth is under, it's below. It's not terminal, it is located on the under surface. Yes. Um, then we have the uh, cold blooded, they are poikilothermic, and they are poikilothermic or ectothermic. They depend on the external temperature. They are majorly marine dwellers, they live in salt water, in oceans and seas. Um, then their tail is heterosaco. The tail is lobed. Yeah, it has lobes. It has parts. But the upper lobe is usually bigger than the lower lobe. And the, that supports them in the swimming because most of them do not have the swim blood. So they use the tail for swimming. They have a cartilaginous skeleton. And that's why they are called a cartilaginous fish. They have, their skeleton is not made uh, from bones. The, the, the skeleton is made up of what? Cartilage. So you can see some of the members there, the shark, the dogfish, well, the stingrays, that is the ray, the ray fish. Uh, we have a number of rays which look quite closer to that, but that particular one is the stingray. They are marine dwellers. They live usually in the bottom of the seas. Then another, the hammerhead shark there. Yes, that one, the head looks like a hammer. So you can see where the mouth is located. It is located on the bottom, uh, on the ventral side, and even the anus, similarly. So that is class chondrichites. Let's look at another class, ostrichites. Class ostrichites, the bony fish, the ostrichites. This include the, the common fish that you know, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa, tilapia, nile perch, herring, and so on. So they include, they have the following characteristics. Uh, they have a bony endoskeleton, the skeleton made up of bones. When you are eating a fish one of these days, it is obvious that you will find bones. So because the type of fish we are eating are the osteochytes, the bony fish. Their mouth is terminal. The mouth is in front. It's not in the bottom like for the the chondrichites. For them, the mouth is in front. Yes, it's terminal. It's at the end of the anterior part. Then the visceral clefts are present. That is to say, they are modified to form gills, uh, which are usually four pairs, and they are covered by the operculum, the gill cover. Then the skin bears cycloid uh scales and others have the tenoid scales those oval shaped or circular scales that cover the body that overlap each other and they are very important for protecting the body and also for camouflage they undergo external fertilization uh, they have the homosaco tail their tail is uniform and if it has lobes the lobes are equal sized that is what we call homosaco um they are also called blooded or poikilothermic or endothermic whatever word you want to use there is okay the some of them especially the larger size like the nile patch have the swim bladder and you must have seen uh yes such swim bladder there they, it grows with the organism the, the bigger the fish the bigger the, the swim bladder it has it's an air bag which facilitates them to float in water for buoyancy However, smaller fish, like the silver fish, do not need the swim bladder because their bodies are already light and they can swim even without any facilitation. <clears throat> Some are marine while others are freshwater dwellers. So you can see there, tilapia, and then we have the herring there, the catfish there, then uh, the Nile patch there. Yes. Then we have another class called Crossopterygota. Crossopterygota. So the class is Crossopterygota, and this includes the lungfish. Yeah, the lungfish. The, these members have paired fins. They are mostly predators, meaning they feed on other smaller fish or other smaller organisms. 
animals within where they live and most of them are freshwater dwellers so we have different types there of lung fishes we have the african lung fish that one should be very common in our habitats i don't know whether you have ever seen it in the swamps some of them burrow deep in the mud and you have to dig to remove them and usually people dry them before they eat they can also bite they have sharp sharp teeth teeth like structures and they can bite and can injure you and uh, that defines their predatory behavior so other species are there there are a number of species great those are the fishes so we are going to move to the closest relative of the fishes and those ones are the class amphibia those are the closest relatives of the fishes they have quite a number of similarities as we shall see so these ones include the newts the salamanders but in africa and where we live i think the toads and the frogs are the majority so in case you get a toad and a frog you can satis you can satisfy your knowledge from them because they have en enough information even if you don't get the newt and the salamander those ones are enough representative so you can see there the frog usually much more lives in water compared to the toad has a more softer skin than the toad yes and then the newts and the salamanders uh, belong to order caudata they have tails and while these other ones do not have they belong to order and they don't have tails the toads and the frogs so let's look at their characteristics they are partly aquatic and partly terrestrial. That is what defines their class, amphibia. Both life, both life. They can live in water, they can live on land. And then they have lungs, which are sac like. And they have uh, soft, moist skin, which is used as a supplementary gaseous exchange surface. So that skin dissolves oxygen and then uh, as it uh, carries out gaseous exchange especially when they are on land even in water they have two pairs of pentadactyl limbs they have four legs then the breeding takes place in water much as they can live on land for some time when it comes to breeding they must return back to water and that of course uh, qualifies them to be very close relatives of the fish and their fertilization is also external just like the fish and then they are cold blooded just like the fish right then they have gills especially in the young ones like the tadpoles tadpoles are used gills and they live entire lives in water so that is why we qualify these members to be very close relatives of the fish however some members have tails at an adult age like the newts and the salamanders members did you know that frogs can swallow the whole food they don't chew they just swallow they pick the grasshopper and swallow so for them there is no negotiation of chewing no just swallowing and the frogs cannot live in salt water particularly and then all amphibians have gills at some level at some stage of their development the larval stage they have gills and that of course defines their closer relationships with the fish uh, and then uh, a group of frogs is called an army hmm, well i don't think you qualify to join that army well the group of frogs is called an army and then the skin is uh, the skin of the amphibian absorbs air and water that is very true uh, however currently the population of amphibians worldwide is deteriorating it's reducing so we can uh, join the struggle to protect our environment because we are losing very many species and in the future some of these species may not be there anymore and our children will not be able to see them so let's protect the environment wherever we are frogs don't have any harm uh, on human beings in fact they even clean the environment they kill the pests in the gardens they eat grasshoppers and so on so when you get them please return them to their habitat if you see a frog jumping during daytime it means there is danger please return it back to its habitat and save it from danger okay let's move to class reptilia 
the reptiles. That one is class reptilia. And these members include the alligators, the crocodiles, the snakes, the lizards, and so on, and their relatives. The alligators and crocodiles are quite similar, but the difference is they are the snout, their mouth structure, they are the terminal part of the mouth. The alligators have a V-shaped snout, and the crocodiles have a V-shaped snout. But they look almost the same. Uh, however, they are larger. Alligators in some books is used to refer to larger reptiles. Yes, we have other members of this that we, we have not mentioned here, but there are so many. There are anacondas and so on. So we can see there uh, the snakes. I'm seeing the puff adder, the cobra, the python, the anaconda there, and many other members. Chameleons, the, the monta lizard. The, the ordinary lizard there, the crocodile. Yes, those are some of the members of uh, class reptilia. The characteristics include the following. They exhibit external fertilization. They have, sorry, they exhibit internal fertilization. So when you look at the previous two classes we have looked at, the fish, and the amphibians, those ones exhibit internal, I mean external fertilization. They lay their eggs, then the fertilization is done externally. For the reptiles, they do internal fertilization, meaning they are much more advanced and their offspring are likely to survive much. They lay, they lay shelled eggs, so their eggs have shells. That means that is the dispatch, the dispersion point. That is the separation point between the amphibians and the reptiles in that the reptiles lay shelled eggs meaning their eggs can be hatched outside they can be hatched outside the water they they, they, they don't have a risk of losing water meanwhile the amphibians their eggs have to be laid in water because they don't have the shells and then they have endoskeleton they have a dry skin of, remember amphibians have a soft skin for them they have dry skin with scales they are poikilothermic also they have uh, called uh, they are called blooded or they are ectothermic if you like and then they are mostly terrestrial most of the reptiles live on land uh, they are gaseous exchange they use lungs and then they lay shelled eggs and that is one of the key achievements of that class that enabled them to colonize uh, the terrestrial what? habitats. So members, I want to thank you very much for being very good students and for following this lesson. We shall meet in the next lesson. The next lesson we shall look at the last, the most advanced members of this uh, fighter. Uh, please meet you there. Thank you very much. God bless.